certainly it's a pleasure being here and uh, telling you about some of the work that we've done at the University of Minnesota and really hoping that it serves as, uh, if nothing else, a message of all the, what we could do in the future uh, based on all the work that's being done right here in California. There's lots to be uh, excited about. So this is going to be a bit of a different presentation. It's going to be more of a um, give and take in this discussion. I'm not going to just be lecturing. You're going to be participating. <clears throat> So be prepared for being called upon. So what I tell you, what I tell you this afternoon is, uh, is, is exciting, but it's going to bring in not only the science, it's going to get into the clinical aspects, it's going to get into the history of medicine, art, and, and, and literature. So I hope that you're not just scientists, that you haven't forgotten some of the humanities uh, that you learned way back. So we're going to begin with this quote. And certainly anybody who knows the, uh, who is the author of this quote, please raise your hand and tell me who it is. Nothing is so fatal to the progress of the human mind as to suppose our views of science are ultimate, that there are no new worlds to conquer. That was stated 199 years ago. It seems pretty relevant today. And what you're going to find is that much of what I talk about was from way back is still relevant today. Does anyone know who said this? I'll give you some more hints. Nellius and Verba. It means take no theory on trust. The founders of a secret society called the Invisible College declared that philosophical dogma must be replaced by inductive reasoning coupled with the crucial experiment. Does anyone know where this came from? Who was the master and who became, or what became of the college? Any ideas? It's Sir Francis Bacon, the father of experimental science. He insisted on the controlled experiment, meaning and manipulating one variable at a time. It wouldn't be for another 250 years that we'd be having blinded experiments or randomized trials, but this is where it began. And the college, the Invisible College, became the Royal Society of Medicine. And Nellius and Verbo was their motto and remains the motto today basically stating that although we have theories, the theories today may be very different in trying to explain what we think is the right answer today may be not the right answer at all, and don't close your mind. The founders of the Royal College has included Isaac Newton and Samuel Pepys, but remember, look at the, the, the quote at the very end. Founding the Royal College, a time when pious politicians sought to control science. Once again, it really was prophetic, or maybe things just don't change. But what I'm going to be describing to you today is a, is a group of stories. Basically, it's a relay race of interrelated plots and subplots. And the race is because a child is going to die without some intercurring treatment. It's a race of scientific exploration, the human struggle in search of hope, and the art of medicine. And this is Charlie on day zero of his stem cell therapy. You can see the stem cells actually being infused in the catheter above him. The story is about severe epidermal lysis bullosa. The manifestations you heard about yesterday by Dr. Al Lane, who had told you about what this awful disease means. It's a severe skin blistering disease. It involves not only the skin, but also the esophagus and, and, and the mouth in one form of this disease, but can involve the mucosa in the more severe form called junctional EB. It results in contractures, strictures of the esophagus, corneal erosions and abrasions of the eyes. It is shortened survival for those kids that die early, most commonly is due to infection because of the breakdown of the mucosal and, and uh, cutaneous barriers. But later in life, those that make it perhaps lucky enough to live to the age of 20 and beyond, most of them will die of an aggressive squamous cell carcinoma. But for all of them, there is some major impact upon their quality of life. And for these more severe forms, their quality of life is horrible. This is a child that I met in Toronto uh, about um, six months ago. Actually, he's 20 years old. He's never had a very good day in his entire life. And he actually came to Grand Rounds when I presented it, and I'll tell you that story in a bit. But the point of this slide is to show you what we're trying to do. We're trying to replace the missing protein, the missing collagen 7 in his particular form called recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. So you can just imagine what his day-to-day -day life might be like. He has a day that is filled with chronic pain. When we talk about epidermolysis bullosa, we're talking about a protein deficiency. And although 
I'm not going to spend a great deal of time do, talking about it. We're talking about really the dermal epidermal junction. You can see the, the epidermis here, the dermis here. We're talking about that junction. Shown in the electron micrograph here, you can see the components of that junction. You can see the lamina densa, the lamina loose of the clear area right there, and you can see the other filamentous fibers that are part of that structure that keeps the outer layer of the epidermis hooked to your body. You can see in the cartoon here basically what we're talking about, about the, what proteins are involved. And we're talking about two specific diseases for what for this presentation is about. Recessive dystrophic epidermolysis where there's a missing collagen 7, which is critical in forming anchoring fibrils that link the lamina densa to the dermis. But also in the junctional form of EB, we're talking about a lamina 332, or historically called lamina 5 deficiency, where it's in that layer between that called the lamina lucida, where you actually have a more severe form of the disease, which involves all mucosal membranes. The key here is to figure out if we can replace those missing proteins in something meaningful that will result in a decrease of the blistering disease and ultimate death. But before I begin any therapy for a patient, regardless of the disease, but in particular this one, I ask the parents and I ask the child what they hope to achieve by the therapy. And in this particular case, I asked the parent, what do you hope the stem cell treatment will do for your child? This mother told me she prayed for her child's death every night, and she hoped that something would change that. And in fact, when I look more about the, into this disease, we find that there's actually something called the Groningen Protocol in Europe, where these kids that are born with junctional form of epidermal lysis bullosa actually can be euthanized, something I wasn't aware of that still continued. It just gives you an idea of how bad this disease is. To reduce the risk of infections that could poison his bloodstream, Peyton must have his wounds washed every two days. When the bath water hits his open wounds, he screams at the top of his lungs. Everybody has to do things that their kids don't like. But, you know, it's, it's, it's no, no way to describe the, the extreme. It gets worse, so I'll spare you that. <clears throat> so I asked the children, what do you hope the stem cell treatment will do for you? And the answers are hysterical half the time. All I want to do is play baseball, but one little girl said, having fingernails so I could put purple polish on them, play hockey, cry with my eyes closed, or I want to wear tennis shoes, cool tennis shoes. The things that you take for granted every day is their dream. So it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. I'm primarily a leukemia doctor, but sometimes there's things worse than cancer. So we began this journey about 2004 when a mother came up to me in front of the United Nations when I was giving a presentation on the use of adult stem cells. And she said, save my child. Well, I was a bit taken aback because there is a child who has blisters and bleeding in front of me, and I didn't even know what this disease was. And so that's how the quest began, of trying to figure out a way of treating this disease. Because what my interest is, is trying to come up with ways of treating kids with incurable diseases. And this seems to be as good as any. So the hypothesis was normal cells would traffic through the skin, secrete collagen 7, assemble into anchoring fibrils, and prevent blistering in these patients with EB. Perhaps it was a very simplistic idea, but then again, I'm a leukemia doctor and didn't know anything about EB. I actually didn't know the kids survived very long. In fact, I learned very much over the past couple of years about this disease. But nonetheless, the idea was fairly straightforward. We thought what we would do is we look at a variety of stem cell populations and see whether or not it would have any impact upon the animals that were, had this disease. And we were very fortunate to work with Dr. Udo at uh, Jefferson Medical College, who provided us with this EB model, where it's a collagen 7 knockout mouse in the B6 black background. And we already had available to us GFP transgenics in this B6 background, and we're able to do these experiments using epidermal stem cells mesenchymal stem cells, multipotent adult progenitor cells, as well as a variety of bone marrow populations and subpopulations, and to see whether or not anything would have any impact upon this disease that would provide us with a proof of concept that this could work, and then hopefully come up with a strategy that would help this child. Well, 
everything failed to begin with. Hundreds of animals went by without any successes, and perhaps it was because the animal model was such that the animals died within two weeks of life. And so whatever cell that might be needed, perhaps it had to work quickly or too quickly um, for any animal to have any benefic benefit whatsoever. But then a surprise occurred. Looking at a CD150 positive, CD48 negative SLAM family population of hematopoietic progenitor cells, we saw that three animals out of 20 survived. This alone was sufficient to allow us to move forward. Doesn't look like very much. Perhaps as a parent, you would want something more as a background piece of information, but it was better than anything we'd ever had before. And in fact, when we sacrificed these animals 80 to 100 days after their uh, infusion of stem cells, which had never occurred before, and that is in terms of the survival, we were able to find that their blisters would decrease or disappear over time. And in fact, we saw these anchoring fibril types of uh, looking strands that perhaps we, we had never seen before. It looked like that perhaps we were doing something that was not only biochemically different, but also clinically different in this animal model. Well, this was sufficient for us to move forward. This was that experimental crucis, experimentum crucis that was being discussed by Francis Bacon 300 years ago that allowed us to say that yes, we have a donor cell that is sitting at the basement membrane associated with deposition of collagen seven that did not previously exist in this knockout model. That was enough to move forward. So from the bench to the bedside. So we created the first in human study uh, for this particular disease. We're using allogeneic hematopoietic stem cells or bone marrow cells because I don't want to say to you that I know it's an hematopoietic stem cell that creates the response that we observe perhaps as some other cell population in the bone marrow, because remember, we have to keep our minds open that even though it's a bone marrow infusion, perhaps it's not a bone marrow stem cell that does its work, or perhaps it is, I just don't know. But gearing up was a big of a it was a lot of the challenge, because you can't use tape, at least not so easily, and in the very first patients we brought in, we would put in a central catheter. For those of you that don't know about bone marrow transplants, we infuse all of our nutrition, antibiotics, blood th uh, component therapies, all through this central catheter that goes into the right atrium of the heart. You put that through the chest wall and it goes tunneled up to the neck, large veins, and that's how you take care of the patients during that early phase of the transplant period. But what happens if you can't use tape? The lines kept falling out over and over and again. That was even before the day of the infusion of stem cells and created lots of problems. But then you took them to the operating room you know, for a procedure that went on for several hours. You can't just intubate them because you can't use tape. So we actually had to then figure out how to wire the, uh, the endotracheal tube to the incisors because you can't use tape. You can't use masks as easily, although you can in some patients. Um, but also these patients had other challenges because they already were coming to us with uh, resistant micro microorganisms on their skin. They all had resistant pseudomonas, they had resistant staph aureus infections, or were just simply colonized, but some of them came to us with cellulitis. Some of them came to us with three organisms in their blood. Four of them came with occult pneumonia that they didn't already have, didn't know they had. So these patients are extraordinarily ill. In fact, we had babies coming to us on pillows being flown in as, as, as weighing two kilograms, trying that they couldn't be touched. You know, and so they would come to us and saying, save this child. And we had two patients die in the emergency room before we had even done anything. So that gives you an idea of just how fragile these children are. We don't take the good patients with epidermal lysis bullosa. We try to take those that we feel are sick enough to undergo the risks of such therapy. But would they undergo the transplant successfully? Because remember, their mucous membranes and their skin is already compromised. They already have infections. And so I'm now going to give them high doses of chemotherapy in order to get this new graft to take so they wouldn't reject the stem cells that were infused. So I'd like to stop for a second and ask a question. And um, I've asked Bernie Lowe, who is a professor at UCSF, uh, uh, who is a uh, director of the program in ethics and medical ethics at that institution and is also a professor of medicine. So Dr. Lowe. I wanted to ask you a question for the audience, and that is to say, when is it okay to depart from the standard of care? And is this a particularly vulnerable population for which there are additional issues that we should consider? And when is risky research justifiable in children? Well, th those aren't simple questions, John. Uh, and you only have okay 13 seconds. <laughs> to depart from the standard of care? Well, when the prognosis is so bad and you have some preclinical evidence that what you have to offer 
might be beneficial, or at least that the benefits out, outweigh the harms. So it's a judgment that you can do better than standard of care. Uh, and then you have to get informed consent. The person who gets the experimental therapy, in this case the parents, have to allow you to go ahead and take on the risks that you told us about in terms of preparing and, and carrying out the treatment. But these parents are, feel desperate. They feel like they have right. no alternative. How well, do we get consent easily? Well, first of all, what you said was you take the sickest of the sick. And in some ways, that's because they have the least to lose. If something goes dreadfully wrong, their prognosis is really bad. You're also, by the way, perhaps tying your hand behind your back because maybe the procedure would work in a healthier patient and not in such a sick patient. But for these very radical, very innovative experimental therapies, we tend to go to the sickest patients for proof of, of principle. These patients, their parents in this case, are desperate. You saw the father every day. It's, it's a trial. So it's very hard to get consent where they really understand that the risks could be even worse than what they're now experiencing because they're, they're desperate. They hope so much. Kids are especially a problem because they can't consent for themselves. If it's an adult cancer patient, cardiac patient, he or she can say, okay, you've explained it. I'm going to go ahead and go for it. But here it's the parents making the decision, so it makes it even more ethically challenging. What is equipoise? So ideally what you'd like is there's a balance. Equipoise means balance, or a rough equivalent between what the ordinary control group will get, the standard of care, versus what you have to offer going in. And it's a big unknown because you don't know when you start a clinical trial. Is it going to be worse? Is it going to be better? And that's why you do the research to answer that, that question. But you want some degree of balance. You can't do it if you have very little evidence of the work. And you probably shouldn't be offering standard care if you already have evidence that the new treatment is better. Well, fortunately, we came up with the same answer. <laughs> So, so basically, as I got started in this, we had to address these issues beforehand because we understood the risks that were involved. Allogeneic transplant is a hard thing for anyone to endure, but someone who already has this degree of mucosal and cutaneous injury is especially challenging. So our moral obligation was to treat this as research, and that seems intuitively obvious, but, the, but the, what I mean by that is, is that we had to say to ourselves that whatever the outcome was, that we would learn from it. And what, whatever we learned from it, we would make changes that were appropriate to hopefully address that, that, that obstacle. So that we didn't keep doing the same thing and exposing other children to the same risks if it wasn't working the way we had hoped. So as I told you, this is actually going to be an interesting um, or different uh, type of presentation because I'm going to bring in not only history, as you've already begun to hear about in the history of science, but I'm also going to bring in to you the literature as it relates to the history of science. And I'm going to ask you several questions over time and give you clues so at the end you make your guess as to what the piece of literature is and who is the author of that literature. The ancient teachers of science promised impossibilities. The modern masters promised that the elixir of life is the chimera. Interesting. Maybe they knew something about stem cells way back. This was written about 200 years ago. Does anybody have any idea who the author and what the piece of literature is and why, how it related to science? I don't see any hands yet. OK, but what I will do is I'm going to give you several more clues and see if you can answer the question. The chimera is shown here. It's a mythological beast which had the body of a lion, the head of a goat, and the tail of a serpent. What this is trying to, in terms of transplant biology, this is the, the state of tolerance that occurs when you take two tissues from two different individuals and put them into one, and that they live together. So the chimera is the elixir of life. Hmm, sounds pretty familiar, and yet this is 200 years ago before they knew about stem cells, or at least I think before they knew about stem cells. So this is clue number one. So let's get back to the patients. Okay, so this is patient number one who underwent this therapy. And let me tell you the initial observations that we, 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 we had in this child. First off, it took 130 days to see any sign of improvement. 
You give the infusion of these cells, nothing happened at first. You know, there was a wishful thinking, there was a bit of a change here, a bit of a change there. But as Dr. Lane and others who take care of these kids would tell you, we see fluctuations anyway, so how do I know for sure that it's a true change or a true benefit? Well, as you can see here, there's maybe a very minor stippled pattern that you might be able to make out of the top of that collagen 7. It's probably mutant collagen 7, that it was picked up by this particular antibody. And I can tell you that in patients, we evaluate them with seven different antibodies if they have collagen 7 deficiency. And usually there's one or two that actually don't pick up anything, whereas the others might. Occasionally you'll have a patient without any collagen and nothing picks up any, anything. But there's a bit of a stippled pattern here. You don't see really much of a difference until you get to around day 130. And clearly at day 200 and day 360, there's clear cut evidence of collagen 7 deposition at the dermal epidermal junction. Now that doesn't tell me whether or not this is becoming an anchoring fibril, but under electron microscopy, you begin seeing these immature uh, anchoring fibrils or what would be called to be a rudimentary form of anchoring fibril, perhaps. But nonetheless, nothing that was convincing of a mature anchoring fibril, and yet, at the same time, this patient clinically was looking better. Fewer dressings were being applied. Activity level was changing. He was off immune suppressive therapy. And yet, you know, it was appearing that perhaps there was something really happening. When we look at not just this patient, but all the patients, we see some different patterns here. For the majority of patients, you see that this is now looking at intensity of fluorescent staining for collagen 7. You see that it continues to increase. But there are a couple of patients where you don't see that same increase. And in fact, in this patient number 6, it took, before we started seeing an increase in collagen 7, it took almost two years. Very different than the others. Usually it's something much earlier than that. But this patient also had no sign of any improvement, perhaps until now. So we don't know when, how this is going to work and what the biology is. We're learning it as we do it. Now, in one patient, patient four, very early on, we saw what appeared to be a mature anchoring fibril. And that's in the singular. <laughs> we saw one and we took it out. That's shown here. That's a patient where it has an anchoring fibril where it has thicker bands. It inserts into the lamina densa as the fan shape. I think you can appreciate the central banding. But not until 2.5 years after the transplant did we see now many normal anchoring fibrils, and this just occurred. Now, one thing I should point out to you, and I'll show you in more detail in a few minutes, is that um, we have outside reviewers look at all this. We don't do any scoring. They're blinded as to uh, the patients. They're blinded as to the time point, and I actually mix it with murine tissue as well. So they're really clearly blinded, and they're not told until after the fact and when I break the blind for them. But this clearly is the first patient and the only patient so far that has normal anchoring fibrils. So that's interesting. And yet, although he didn't have anything earlier, his skin was markedly improved. So challenging our hypothesis that you had to have not only collagen 7, but you had to have anchoring fibrils before you'd have cutaneous improvement. And that was not the scenario that we observed. So this is what happened in patient number one. You see the before pictures, the after pictures. But again, as the dermatologists would tell you that take care of EB, you see fluctuations anyway. So how are we going to come up with something you know, more objective than this? So we see patients every 30 days in the early time point at six months, then at one year, at one and a half years, at two years, on and on and on. And we take serial photographs, the same photographs of the same areas of skin, and we try to do something that is actually more objective. But we also then do a variety of other studies that I'll describe in the next few slides. One is we'll take multiple skin biopsies, and we will evaluate not only for collagen 7 and anchoring fibrils, but we'll also now evaluate for the proportion of cells that are donor-derived. Interestingly, 6 to 93 percent of the cells in the skin become donor-derived. 6 to 93 percent. Even if there's blood cells, it can't be 93 percent. So that was pretty remarkable. However, this is what the, me the means are. You can see here over time, there's typically, this little bump occurs at day 60, but it typically hovers around this 20 to 25 percent range. Now again, this is the mean, and unfortunately I didn't know how to put the error bars on myself, so that's the reason why they're not there. But this is pretty, pretty remarkably common. I mean, this is not something that is just a single patient. But when we had the one chance 
patient number five, for whom we had a male recipient, a male donor to go in a female recipient, and so unfortunately the only one so far, we had the capacity of not only just looking by, you know, using molecular probes for determining donor versus host, we now had the ability to follow XY by fish analysis and then co-stain them with markers that would tell us whether or not they're hematopoietic. We also stained this, so here's the XY, Y in red, X in green, and you can see that these cells here co-stain with this blue marker, which is the CD45 positive marker. So the majority of cells that are in this particular field that stain with the XY, or that are XY positive, are also staining with CD45, indicating that they are some type of blood type of cell, hematopoietic cell. None of the XY co-expressed CD31, so they weren't endothelial cells that were derived from the donor. But I should point out to you that there were other cells that did not co-stain with CD31 or anti-CD45. What they are, it's only conjecture right now, but nonetheless, they were above and below the dermal epidermal junction. I think you can appreciate the Y and the X in these cells. So there's more work to be done, but perhaps there is non-hematopoietic engraftment. I cannot tell you what the stem cell origin of those are, but nonetheless, that's the observation. So again, in our attempt to figure out something more objective, we developed what we call the blister test, where you expose a small patch of skin to a negative pressure, and you can see here what it would look like in this first generation. Again, we have to make these as we go along, but this idea was not new. It's something we didn't develop, but the device we had to develop. And you, all we do is we simply then expose the, negative, the skin to negative pressure and just clock how long it takes to develop the blister. In the donor, who is not a carrier, it takes roughly 60 minutes for that blister to form, at least the way we do the test. And we actually do it in two patches of skin, one arm, one leg, and we do the same arm and leg every single time point. And you see the mother and father who are obligate carriers have something in between. They're not normal, but they phenotypically don't have blistering disease. And then you have then the pre-analysis before the infusion of stem cells. And in this particular patient, patient seven, it took about 11 minutes for the blister to form. But look what happened after the transplant. So although you can see the photographs and you could say, yes, patches of skin go up and down, you see here that there is something different that appears to be different. And in fact, at day 180, has a more resistance to blistering than her mother. So interesting phenomenon. Again, something a bit better than just my observations. We also measure the weight of the dressings on and on. But again, this is at least one more objective measure. So at the end of the day, no one thought that using hematopoietic stem cells might be useful. Um, but maybe they might be. But also people believe that anchoring fibrils were going to be necessary to see clinical improvement. But that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case, at least not totally. And then are there stem cell populations in marrow that might home to the skin? We don't know what those CD45 negative cells are as yet. But together, perhaps we're challenging dogma. And we know where that gets us especially when we're dealing with stem cells. Galileo thought he had it hard. Clue number two. Treading on the steps already marked, I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers, and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of the creation. What we're trying to do is explain our observations with stem cells and trying to make it something meaningful for the treatment of patients everywhere. But remember, could get us in trouble, and perhaps already has. So we have one person who's raised her hand who might know what this is, so don't answer the question yet, but you're getting closer. So I have to say to you that no one's guessed this early before. I think that's good, we have two people. At least I can see if there's bright lights, so there may be more. So playing God. Let me first ask a question who might know the answer to this. Dr. Trounson, you do this every day as president of CIRM. <laughs> What does it mean to play God? And I'm actually, I put you on the spot. And I'm teasing, you're not to answer the question. <laughs> but Dr. Lowe needs to answer the question as our bioethicist. How fair. <laughs> well, flip, what does it mean to play? When, when people say you're playing God, what does that mean? Flip back one slide. So. That's easier said than done. You need God for that. Okay. So, so can I tell them what this is? Yes. So the picture you probably know is from the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling that Michelangelo painted. And 
there are people who believe there are some things that are, should be beyond the ability of men to question, explore, challenge, work on. That there are things which one believes as, you use the term dogma, other people might use the term faith. And so playing God has this idea that men, women, scientists are doing things that should be outside the realm of human endeavor. Thank you. It's also in my mind when people say that about medicine, it means do you understand what you're getting into? That sometimes only God could understand what the full ramifications are. That's probably one of the big concerns about embryonic stem cell research. Do you really understand the full ramifications of all that we do? Interestingly, you know, I mean, people were very concerned when I did the first uh, use of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, diagnosis for the Savior sibling. I did that in 2000 in a child with Fanconi anemia who was going to die because she had no donor that was available. And we took that technology that we didn't develop, but we actually applied it and made it clinically useful. We now do nine procedures every single day, including Saturdays and Sundays, for the purpose of not only having a child that's healthy, but of the child to be a healthy donor. So you can imagine where people got very nervous about that, and it was a very huge you know, controversial issue. But the question really came down all the time is when they said you're playing God, what they meant by that is that do you understand what the importance of HLA is? And perhaps I don't. But I don't believe that enough of these can be done that we could change genetics and change evolution, if that was what the concern was. And the issue of designer babies was not really something that we were interested in. But I think it's the, the point of playing God is, do you understand what you fully or, or what you are doing? This relates to the piece of literature that I'm showing you, and we'll come back to the meaning in the not too distant future. But when we go back to look at what happened with these kids with EB, and this is true in my prior uh, work as well, there's a recurring theme. Patients typically are in awe of it, and the scientific community is really uneasy with it. And typically, there's a backlash. And in fact, I was called a witch doctor. I was called everything you could ever imagine. And it was even called the name of the book that, uh, or the, the, the piece of literature that I'm discussing. Because we were taking a vulnerable population and exposing them to high risk, you know, was that an appropriate thing to do? And I think of it the other way around, and that is, is that you know, not doing something exposes them to considerable risk. But there's a balance there, and these are not easy answers for what we do. But I think all of you that are working in stem cells that hopefully one day will translate into something meaningful for patients that have these horrible diseases, you have to think about what the implications are. The implications are you know, not just so simply as a cure. What happens if you find a cure is something that you have to think about. And I'll show you what happened to us when we came up with a treatment that actually benefited some patients. The reality is this. You know, it does come at a price. There are significant risks in this particular patient population. There were deaths, but there were deaths while waiting. The FDA asked us to have a month interval between every patient that we brought in so that they weren't exposed to excess risks. It made sense. But I had multiple patients die while waiting, even though they had been approved for the transplant and they were coming in, but they got in a queue and were pushed to like three or four or five months later because there were already patients in line. So that's a risk. But also, there were risks because the patients could not get insurance approval and died while trying to attain that. But the therapy is toxic. And for those that did make it to transplant, there were deaths. Two had a chemotherapy-related death, one died of opportunistic infection, and one died of graft rejection. But there was also considerable regimen-related toxicity, at least in one patient, as you can see here. This is what she looked like beforehand. But look what happened at day 17. It was horrendous. I haven't seen anything like this for about 10 years. And yet you see this, how bad it is. And then miraculously, she survived it and had the best skin I had ever seen on a child with EB. These are just residual scarring. And you know, it, it, was, it was miraculous. But we don't keep on doing the same thing over and over again. If it is too toxic, you change the therapy in some way. So the first change was trying to introduce mesenchymal stem cells because there was work done, and that's what this is. Everything else is exactly the same. Remember, 
You know, the ex science is supposed to be driven by manipulating one variable at a time when possible, so we just add mesenchymal stem cells and change nothing else. And there were some reasons for doing that, because in the animal model, it demonstrated that by co-infusing mesenchymal stem cells plus hematopoietic stem cells, it appeared to give us a benefit beyond that what we saw with hematopoietic stem cells alone. And this was also work that was done by a, another famous uh, uh, um, dermatologist working in the field of EB, who discovered this in an animal model of junctional form, that more severe form that we alluded to previously. There's other some potential other benefits that might be useful, but nonetheless, we move that forward. Well, we've now since done about 12 patients with this co-infusion of hematopoietic stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells, and I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure that the addition of mesenchymal stem cells changed very much, but at least that was the rationale for making a change because we wanted to make it better and safer. But what I can tell you is in two patients who did have junctional, who was able to survive long enough to get the transplant, you see here that one of the patients for which we have the data on, there is nothing before transplant at the dermal epidermal junction. At day 100, you see evidence of that lamina 332 that was missing prior to transplant, now clearly evident after transplant. You see what the blister test looked like over time in that particular patient. You can see the molecular evidence uh, of lamina 332 being present. This was a control. And then this is at day 33, day 77, day 118, and clearly the skin continued to get better over time looking at that. Now the patient has wearing no dressings. That's pretty remarkable. For a child that came to us with three organisms in his blood as well as uh, um, uh, meningitis. This is what his skin looks like now. But at the end of the day, our overall survival rate is 76%. This is in the first 17 patients. There are now 19, but the others are relatively early after transplant. You see that there's also variable responses. Not everyone had that dramatic response where they're nearly free of all the dressings. But most everyone is in between, you know, and it's changing over time. And remember, some of them took several years to show up, any improvement. And in fact, when I, one of the ones I have that was no clear response is one that is actually just starting to perhaps have a response now, two, two and a half years later. But now we made another change because of the fact that it's still too toxic. Even if the patients get through it, there was other side effects. So we have to make a change. And we then use a dose-reduced therapy, much, much less chemotherapy. But would it be sufficient to get engraftment reproducibly? And I can't tell you the answer to that yet. We've only enrolled one patient who was 20 years old, who underwent this therapy, whose mother said, I prayed for death every night. So he just went home, actually just two days ago. The patient underwent the therapy, again changing one thing, this time the preparative therapy, got the same hematopoietic stem cells, the same mesenchymal stem cells, all the same tests after transplant. And what we were able to show is that he only had two days of neutropenia because most of his cells in the early time period were a host. He did not lose his uh, circulating white cells at any time point. He never required a single platelet transfusion, although it dipped down to about 40,000. And then he never received a single transfusion of red cells. Now, one patient, maybe I'll never be able to reproduce this, but it gives us the idea that the proof of concept can work even in this particular disease for which I thought we would have to give much more chemotherapy originally. And he had no infections. He had no organ dysfunction. The only complication was cyclosporin related, which was a transient problem with hypertension and vomiting while taking his pills. But you can see what happened with his engraftment over time. At day 14, he was three per, in his T cell compartment, 3% donor. In the CD15 compartment that does the neutrophils, 9% donor. But look what happened at day 100, roughly. 91%, 93%, and his skin is hovering between 23 and 18% donor cells. So if we can do it with a lot less therapy, a lot less risk, this is the way to go and changes really how we do things, I think, moving forward. But we do want to make sure that we're not exaggerating our responses. People don't believe what we're telling them because we see it, but again, it's not easy to give you an objective answer. We can measure the dressings, we can look at the photographs, we can do all those things, but it's not clear cut. So what we do is we have these three experts you know, from different parts of the country or world. John McGrath is in London, Alain Havernan is in uh, Paris, and Dr. Shimizu is in uh, uh, Japan, although actually one of his co-workers is actually doing the workforce now since he was ill. 
But the point is, is that we, th we use them in two or three different ways. They actually determine the patient eligibility. I don't. I give them all the information, and they say, are they severe enough or not to undergo this risky therapy? Then they review the outcome data. We give them everything. And then they judge whether or not there's a response or not. And then we give them the blinded assessments of the electron micrographs to determine whether or not there's an increase in anchoring fibrils or not. And then they decide whether or not, you know, to our uh, FDA reviewers, what kind of re toxicity profile and response we've observed. Again, all we seek is the truth and objectivity. And it's hard to do it when you're the actual caretaker for these patients, as well as the PI and sponsor of the IND. So I told you before that we're now doing the savior sibling idea in this particular group of patients. One patient so far has had this, um, but obviously it only makes the uh, ethics issues a bit more complicated. But overall, I think you understand why we're doing it. Certainly having a sibling donor is safer than unrelated. So clue number three. It was a dreary night in November that I beheld the accomplishment. I collected my instruments around me that I might infuse the spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. Now, does anyone know who this might be? Dr. Trounson, you still there? <laughs> Clue number four, such were the words that fate announced to destroy me. Okay, so who wrote this? And the work is? The complete title? Correct. Who said that? Okay, Mary Shelley, and I'll, t I'll show you that in a sec. Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus. So Mary Shelley told this as a nighttime story in 1815 to her poet lover and future husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and friend Lord Byron. We should all have friends like that. <laughs> in his villa on Lake Geneva. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> And so she told this story as a, as, as a scary story for that evening and came up with Frankenstein. Who was Frankenstein? Victor Frankenstein. So Frank, Victor Frankenstein is actually the scientist. He's, and yet he's probably the true monster in all this. And that's part of the story. So tell me, who was Prometheus? It's your chance to shine. <laughs> So yes, this was, this was the guy that was chained down, had his liver pecked away by um, a bird. But why, did, why, was he, why was he being punished by the gods? He brought, he brought fire from the heavens. OK, so Dr. Lowe, <laughs> who, who coined the who <laughs> The audience is doing a lot better than I am. Who coined the term the modern Prometheus? He's, a, he's the most famous of all bioethicists, or ethicists. Okay, I'm going to ask for help. For this. <laughs> Any, anybody, just raise your hand and shout it out. Have you ever heard of Immanuel Kant? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so why is he famous? So he was a, a German philosopher and ethicist, and one of the things he said was that uh, man should be governed by reason, and the way you could tell something was ethically appropriate or not, was that you should act in a way that you, what you did could be binding for every human being. So it's a universal appeal that it's not just something that you believe, but it has to be something that every other rational person would accept. So the reason why I bring this up is that he coined the term the modern Prometheus to mean reflecting one person in the world that of that time. Who would have been the modern Prometheus in 1800? He coined the term referring to Benjamin Franklin. He was considered the most preeminent scientist in that period of time. Why would he have coined him the modern Prometheus? He brought the fire from the heavens. Now, interestingly, Mary Shelley knew of Benjamin Franklin. And so as she was creating this story, and there's a, it's very fascinating to, to understand how she created the different characters in that. But as it turns out, there was two possible ways of reasons for choosing Frankenstein as the name of the, 
of the story, perhaps related to Franklin. But it was also related to a castle, Frankenstein, that existed also. But she was also very intrigued with the new, medicine, new medical sciences. And she was trying to understand what were the possibilities with science. And she was very concerned. And she wrote the story, really, as a warning. A warning to scientists that be careful about what you do, because there might be untold consequences, and you're responsible for them. It's the reason why Frankenstein is really the tragedy. It's not the monster himself, who has no name. It was the scientist, because he didn't try to figure out what he was doing beforehand. So interesting that we have this literature and we have this royal society developed hundreds of years ago that really teach us lessons that still are relevant today. So let me just summarize the work that I've done. Substantial chimerism persists in the skin over time with continued deposition of C7, leading to amelioration of the mucocutaneous manifestations of RDEB. Clinical improvement is not dependent upon mature anchoring fibrils. And less intensive regimens may be really the key of doing this in a more safe way. Remember, Charlie, that first photograph in the very beginning where he was getting these cells infused? Well, his wish was, I just want to wear my new tennis shoes. And he did. So the conclusions are to have high expectations, lead by example, compel others, and instill hope always. That's what we do when we're doing this on the front lines, taking care of patients each day. I need to acknowledge a number of people, most notably Jacob Tolar in our group, but many others, including John McGrath, Doug Keen, Akimi Yoshida Yamamoto, and David Whitley, and Mei Chen, uh, who are in California. Thank you very much. So are there any questions for John? Well, thank you oh. for staying. It has been, uh, I'm surprised, this is now Friday at, after 5. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Yes. Uh, that was a great talk. I just had a question uh, regarding your uh, stem cell delivery. Um, is it possible that you could um, improve stem cell delivery to the skin by, let's say, a few costellation of the cells themselves to improve homing to the skin? So. It's a yeah. good question. That, that may be. That, that certainly is. A, it, one thing I should tell you, though, is that being a leukemia doctor, um, I should have told you how much it cost me to do all this work. Total of $560,000 over a period of seven years. Um, and so if, until we are able to get the publications out, we can't get any grants. So good idea, but we have to hold out for a little bit longer before we can answer that question. But really an intriguing idea of improving homing. One thing I should tell you, though, that what's, what's interesting is that by giving GCSF, which is a way of mobilizing stem cells out of the bone marrow microenvironment, is also a way of increasing the engraftment uh, in the skin. But that could simply be due to increased numbers of white cells in the skin, but still, it actually gives you a clinical response, an intriguing idea that it may, might be useful in the non-transplanted patient as well. Uta? Um. Can you comment or can you tell us um, how the Savior siblings are prepared for learning that they were Savior siblings? Well, what I can tell you that over time, not in EB, but in general for the Savior siblings, you know, what we've been doing is at least the patients that we've cared for, that we, we, we actually ask those questions about how do you feel afterwards and through a series of, uh, as a part of a scientific project, trying to figure out whether or not there's any negative impact. You know, they, 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 so far they've all grown up in loving families and they're cherished for themselves and actually like to brag oftentimes to their sibling that was saved, saying that I saved your life and you owe me for the rest of your life. <laughs> However, the oldest one is only 11 now, um, born August 29th, 2000. So uh, the, um, you know, the time period is still short. One of the remarkable things about this therapy is that the stem cells are normal, healthy stem cells. They're not untreated or engineered. Um, to what extent is this a pointer forward to other diseases of this type? 
um, other skin diseases or other organs? Well, that, that's, that's an intriguing question. I think that one thing that we should point out to you is that one of the reasons why I think that these cells are perhaps homing to the skin is simply because there's this tremendous inflammatory response in EB. Um, and so tissue damage, you know, is probably, I wouldn't be surprised to find it be, to be quite critical. And the reason why I say that is that if you do biopsies of non-involved skin, you find very, very little engraftment um, in that particular area. Interestingly, in one patient where they actually, if you look at where the skin blisters were before transplant, those have completely resolved. But she has areas of blistering that were not blistering at the time of transplant. And it just makes you wonder if these stem cells only go to where it's happening at the time that the infusion of cells is actually being given. So there's many unknowns, and this is complete conjecture. But um, in any event, I have a feeling the injury is necessary. So if we go to other diseases, we would have to be keeping that in mind that I wonder if injury is important. It's interesting. And genetics of collagen 7, do you resequence this gene in every patient yet? Um, we, not every patient, but we have, we, yes, we have in about probably half of them. Yes. So I apologize for a non-scientific question, but this is driving me crazy. What, what is this picture at the end? And, and I was wondering what this, uh, what were you trying to convey with this? <laughs> <laughs> I guess everything else had a meeting in here. It's, it's sort of, you know, the, 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 sort of the, the blind rapture of what I was saying, you know, during the question and answer period. That's all I was saying is that, you know, uh, or perhaps that you're, you're all falling asleep and are feeling like you're being punished <laughs> and captive. <laughs> John, quick question. You had the, I mean, it was a, you didn't know what you didn't know, and then you tried and you learned something. And obviously, it was the rigor and the follow up that was so important. But have you experienced situations where folks that are pushing stem cell therapies, um, sort of the quack clinics as we sometimes refer to them, have they used you as an example? Or, you know, have you? sort of encountered that, that, you know, well, you just give it a, you need to give it a try. Oh, okay. absolutely. So if you look at a number of websites, they will, I mean, basically, you know, they'll take anybody's results. And even if it's, you know, allergenic, they'll, and, you know, for what I do, then they'll just say it works for autologous as well, particularly in the core blood field, which is really where my work has all been, you know, historically, you know, um, you know, it is, it is quite remarkable how they have such a stretch, at, at, you know, as saying, well, if it works in leukemia, it'll work for heart disease. And, it, you know, I've even gotten letters from them saying, well, you know that, you know, that this is going to be curing multiple sclerosis and diabetes. And, you know, it is quite remarkable how they'll have a stretch of when one disease might be benefited that it fixes all diseases as well. But nonetheless, I mean, you know, we just have to kind of, I mean, this is just how the world is. And I think that, you know, we just have to just plod through ourselves and try to really find out what's true and what's not true and not use their methods. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, John.